So it's our pleasure uh, to have uh, here with us in Brockton this morning the State Secretary uh, of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Matthew Beaton. And uh, in addition to addressing the mayors uh, from across the Commonwealth today, uh, the Secretary also is here to make a grant presentation to the City of Brockton. So I'd like to introduce Secretary Beaton so that he can make that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you all. Uh, looking forward to today's uh, uh, event, but uh, also happy to be here in another capacity and uh, announcing uh, a, a grant award for $280,000 coming to the uh, City of Brockton through the Department of Energy Resources LED Changeout Program, a new initiative uh, spearheaded by Governor Baker. Uh, two, of, uh, two of Governor Baker's favorite things in our world are trees and lights, and he said, <laughs> I want you to change out all the lights and I want you to plant as many trees as you can. And actually a couple of months ago we were down here yeah, right. for, uh, for one of those programs because the city of Brockton is also uh, one of our uh, gateway, greening the gateway cities communities where we're doing a tree uh, planting program throughout the city. And uh, now we are here to celebrate uh, uh, the, some more money coming for LED change outs. Uh, these are, I think you're going to be doing over 7,000 lights in the, the, the big spectrum of what you're doing. Uh, and I think there, uh, you know, the, the difference will soon be seen as soon as these are installed. They provide uh, much better uh, uh, lighting, uh, saves the city a tremendous amount of money, uh, helps us on the state side meet our energy efficiency goals. Uh, we are number one in energy efficiency for six years in a row in the Commonwealth, and programs like this really help us uh, in achieving our carbon reduction goals. So this is a, a great program. We just uh, we awarded a larger uh, $4 million uh, of awards uh, throughout the Commonwealth, from every corner of the Commonwealth, and we are happy to be here today uh, in the city of Brockton uh, to, to, to give them uh, their uh, piece of the greater LED changeout program and on that I would like to uh, ask the mayor to come on up and <coughs> do the official right. uh, handoff of All the right. citation get, for this get here in the picture and the too. senator yeah. congratulations right. and thank you for being such a great partner that is uh, you know it's always great to be back in the city the city of champions uh, and you have been a great partner with a number of our programs and uh, you know Mr. Mayor your leadership down here is really uh, what what makes it possible for us to uh, to, you know, it's easy to, uh, to, to hand off the check, but you do a great job of actually implementing and using the money, and, uh, you know, we thank you for that very much. So on behalf of Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito, we thank you and the entire city. Right. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Secretary. Why don't you hold on to it, and I'll acknowledge it, too. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I, I do want to acknowledge uh, Senator Brady representing our entire legislative delegation for their support and assistance in helping us to uh, obtain this grant. About uh, close to three years ago now, uh, we as a city made a commitment to become a green community. And uh, we came to find out that was a lot more work than we thought it was when we decided it was a good idea. Uh, but the work did, did come to fruition during the past year when we became a green community. <clears throat> and at that time, just becoming a green community uh, earned us a grant of over half a million dollars for energy conservation from the state. Uh, but a, an integral part of our plan in becoming a green community was the replacement of all of our uh, street lights with LEDs. And uh, you're right, Mr. Secretary, over 7,000 street lights, close to 9,000 lights altogether when we include the uh, schools and parks and playgrounds. So it is a massive project that's already underway and that conversion is, is going on today as we speak. The initial estimated cost of the project was $3.6 million and uh, through a lot of great work with our DPW department, our procurement department, everyone that was involved, we ultimately brought that project in a million dollars less than projected at $2.6 million. Uh, and then we were able to receive rebates from National Grid of close to a million dollars and with uh, over a quarter of a million dollars more that the secretary was nice enough to bring us today, we've actually driven the, the net cost of the project down to about 1.4 million. And what that means with the energy savings, the, the value of the energy savings of these lights, they use over 60% less energy than the current old lights that we have. 
these lights will pay for themselves in two and a half years or less. Uh, these are lights that come with a 10-year warranty. So I'm pretty sure that's a good deal for the city, um, uh, that we've really been able to dramatically reduce uh, the net cost of this. And another exciting part of the project is that in putting up the LED lights, we're also able at the same time to ins install smart controls that will allow us to save even more money with the lights. We'll be able to brighten them and dim them at different uh, hours of, of the day and night. Uh, but in addition to that, those smart controls now become um, our platform as we are able to now add additional technology uh, in the process of becoming a uh, a smart community also. So uh, we're excited about the technology, we're excited uh, about the savings, we're excited about the fact that this is a big part of Brockton's reducing its carbon footprint and fulfilling the commitment we made when we became <coughs> a green community. So I'd just like to thank Secretary Beaton very much, acknowledge our legislative delegation for their help and for all of our partners and agencies that have assisted us in earning green community status, thank you. Good morning. I hope everyone had a wonderful summer, even though it seems like it's still continuing for another few days. Welcome to the City of Champions, the City of Brockton. It is my pleasure as uh, President of the Mayor's Group to welcome all of you here. And I will turn this over to uh, Mayor Carpenter shortly. But I just wanted to offer a few remarks about uh, Bill and his work as Mayor. Bill is a 27-year resident of Brockton, and he raised his six children here, and I understand that they are still residents of Brockton also. He's the 48th mayor of Brockton, and he was elected in 2014, and he's finishing up his second term. He served, prior to serving as mayor, he did, he served two terms as a school committee member and is the co-founder of Independence Academy. This is the fourth high school in the state that is, oh, was developed to educate children who are in drug recovery programs. Um, pretty a remarkable uh, initiative on the part of the mayor. During his time as mayor, he's really focused on the revitalization efforts of Brockton. I think you can see outside the window in terms of what's happening here, too. And I'm sure he'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, and it also was nice to see that he finally was able to uh, bring back a city planner after eight years. I couldn't imagine not having a city planner as mayor. Uh, he's championed the uh, blueprint for, for Brockton, which is a 30-year uh, guide, from what I understand for uh, the future and vision of the city. And he also has been doing a lot of work in terms of Brockton's partnership, public-private relationships. I would also like to congratulate you, Bill, on your $10 million Mass Works grant. Uh, these gateway cities, they just seem to get that leg up on some of us in terms of these uh, Mass Works grants. Uh, I hope your city council is a little easier than mine was in terms of funding the gap in the construction, because uh, these are are important economic development projects for our city. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to recognize about uh, Mayor Carpenter is that he is recognized for his statewide leadership in terms of dealing with the opioid crisis. And he is the mayor that has been selected by the governor to serve on his um, the opioid addiction working group. And during his second term, this past term, Bill championed uh, his, uh, what's called the Champion Plan, which is an addiction outreach program that has helped a tremendous amount of, of people in his city. I didn't know on a side note if you were aware that Bill is, uh, has, I guess, quite a, uh, a voice for radio and had been the voice of Brockton High School sports for 17 years. So, but uh, would you please welcome our host today, Mayor Bill Carpenter, and as his logo says, only a carpenter can build a city. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Holiday, and thanks to all of, of you that made the uh, trip down today. I know that today's date is not an easy one for many of you. Um, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, I 
personally thank both uh, Secretary Beaton, who's here with us now, and Secretary Ash, who will be joining us in just a little while for taking their time to uh, come and uh, meet with the mayors here today. Uh, I want to make sure we acknowledge our sponsors. So CDM Smith uh, sponsored the breakfast that we're having this morning. And at the conclusion of the business part of the meeting, we invite you to join us for lunch directly across the street in the uh, W.B. Mason headquarters where they're hosting uh, what they promised me to be a very nice uh, luncheon for all of us. Um, just when I was becoming mayor, uh, or shortly after, about four years ago, W.B. Mason Company had to make a decision about the future of their company and their headquarters. Uh, they were considering moving out of downtown Brockton and maybe uh, building out near a highway somewhere or whether to remain here where they had begun and always been. And fortunately for the city of Brockton, they made the decision to stay. And in the building that they were already in, uh, they made a commitment. They renovated the third and fourth floors of the building. They made an $8 million investment in the building with their commitment to stay. Beautiful historic restoration. Uh, that expansion brought 100 new employees to downtown Brockton working every day. Uh, so their commitment to Brockton has been enormous, particularly their commitment to the downtown. And uh, so we invite you, please come over, grab a bite, and uh, take a quick look at the, the building because they've done a spectacular job. I have also been asked to mention uh, the 10 minute walk to a park campaign. So if you're not familiar with that, that is uh, being launched on October 10th. I signed on to it. Over 100 mayors nationally have joined. And it's making a commitment on behalf of your city um, to get to the point where every resident would live within a 10 minute walk to a park or playground. And uh, that's been an initiative of, of ours in our first two terms in terms of investing in parks and playgrounds. But when we think about quality of life and attracting people to come back and live in cities, uh, I think this initiative is critical. So I, they'll have the information here for you today, I believe, but um, October 10th is the kickoff event. So I encourage you to check out the information and, and hopefully join us on October 10th as we kick off that campaign. I just want to take two minutes to tell you a little bit about where you're at and, and what you're looking at here. Um, because we, we chose this space, this is artist gallery space here as part of the Enterprise Center complex uh, that's, that you're in. Um, because uh, to give you some sense of our vision of where we're going with downtown Brockton, this particular project that you're in, um, at the front of the block, there's about 55,000 square feet of commercial and retail space. Uh, there are um, 42 units of artist housing that go with this gallery. And those are combined live-in workspaces at reduced rents uh, to, to bring artists into the building and they're able to utilize this gallery space uh, to show off their work. There's also an additional 71 units of uh, Mixed, mixed income housing, multiple income level housing, and we also have some on-site management offices here. We have tried to seek, as Mayor Holiday mentioned, a couple of MassWorks grants that we've been able to get the past two years to capitalize on the investment that's been made here. So what you see going on behind me here, this block of Center Street out to this intersection, is last year's MassWorks grant and we had about $60 million of new investment on this side of the street, $8 million of new investment on that side of the street, and one of the worst blocks of roadway you've ever seen in your life down the middle between the two of them. Uh, and so our grant proposal was to replace this block along with the full streetscape and improvements in the intersection that you see going on behind me here, because this is Route 123. This is the eastern gateway into the downtown, and, and we really believe that this will completely change folks' impression as they come into the downtown and, and really highlight the millions of dollars of investment that's been made on both sides of the street. An interesting feature of it also is we dug the road up, 
it gave us the opportunity uh, to be able to install high capacity fiber optic network uh, that will be able to now link into downtown businesses and we think this will be a real advantage in uh, convincing businesses to locate in the downtown. And we, we have tried to take advantage of every district zone program credit incentive that the state offers if it helps us uh, bring back downtown. So uh, uh, we were designated a, a TDI community. Um, in our first year, we, we got a grant that helped us complete a, a downtown action strategy. That downtown action strategy includes both an urban renewal plan and uh, a DIF district, district improvement financing. Uh, where you're seated right now, you're also in our HDIP district and you're also in our 40-hour smart growth, growth district. So we've been able to overlap, uh, overlay, I guess I should say, multiple economic development incentives. And we're, we're seeing the interest coming. The building just behind me, the uh, Brockton Furniture Building, or United Furniture Building, which by the way, if you look closely in the movie Detroit was used, uh, they filmed some scenes in front of it. They changed it to make it look like the 1960s, which wasn't a lot of work, uh, but <laughs> I think they basically changed the signs, yeah. Um, uh, but more importantly, uh, that, uh, that property is, is un now under a development agreement, uh, and that will be uh, about 50 units of, uh, of market rate, 80% market rate housing, with uh, maintaining uh, retail and uh, commercial on the first floor, great mixed use development really represents the model of uh, what we're looking to develop here in downtown. So I appreciate you all joining us here today for the meeting. Uh, I know some of us had primaries yesterday. Uh, mine was fortunately last week, uh, but we thank you very much for being here. And are we going right to Secretary Beaton now? Yes, okay. So. We'll get the secretary up here. We're really fortunate today to have two cabinet secretaries uh, joining us. And um, Matt Beaton is our Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, he and his uh, departments, I guess I should say, have been great partners to us here in the city of Brockton, have been great for us to work with. Uh, the secretary is a strong advocate of advancing clean energy initiatives. Uh, he has supported city's efforts across the state uh, in sustainability uh, and resiliency. So we certainly appreciate his efforts being willing to partner with cities across the Commonwealth. We look forward to hearing him this morning. Uh, secretary Matthew Beaton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you not only for the kind introduction, but for hosting us all here today. Thank you, Mayor Holiday, as well. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for, for showing up and giving me the opportunity to come uh, speak with all of you today. It's uh, been a, uh, a long desire of mine to, to, to come before all of you, and finally the day has come. And uh, wonderful to be here in Brockton. Brockton, I've, I've shared this uh, with the mayor before, has a special little place in my heart. I grew up in a big boxing family. And uh, I actually have two pictures of Rocky Marciano in my office, kind of my motivating, uh, the, the famous one of him squared off in the, uh, in the ring. And then another one of uh, this really special picture. Um, I'm from Central Mass, and my grandfather used to own a restaurant in Worcester, old Italian guy, him and his brothers. And uh, this is a great picture of all these old Italian guys with all busted up noses sideways. And, and then right at the top of all of these gentlemen is Rocky Marciano in my grandfather's restaurant. So very special place for me here in Brockton and a uh, uh, little insight into some of the walls in my office. So it's uh, great, to, uh, great to be here um, in Brockton and uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, we have, some of the initiatives that we've been putting forward uh, on, on, at EEA under Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito. And uh, I really want to, because uh, I believe we're going to do a little Q&A at the end, want to make sure that um, I, I really answer any questions that you might have. Um, I was asked to talk about one issue in particular and then had a couple of other ones that I wanted to just put on everybody's radar screen. Uh, but one is, I think, so a topic that's probably not uh, unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, certainly Mayor Vigent, I know, has uh, uh, testified and pr provided some support for us on uh, NIPTES, uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Uh, 
this is something, again, I'm sure you are all familiar with uh, relative to wastewater and stormwater. You know the story with the MS4 permit and the delay with the EPA. All of you have dealt, I'm sure, with some level of uh, wastewater treatment and uh, that point source uh, effluent entering our water bodies and the control over that. We in Massachusetts are one of f four states that does not have the delegated authority from the Environmental Protection Agency to actually manage and run the program on a state level. So basically what we are trying to do with the piece of legislation Governor Baker, Baker has filed is try to assume that authority for Massachusetts to give us the power and the ability to work closely with our municipal partners on the ground to implement the NPDES program. Uh, there's a number of reasons why we would all want and why generally you know, municipalities have been supportive of this over time. Matt, well, for starters, Massachusetts has uh, national leadership in, in running uh, environmental programs, our energy conservation, energy and environment really has Massachusetts on a pedestal. We are national leaders that, you know, you, you pick the program, there's a million other, uh, uh, other communities and states modeling themselves after what Massachusetts is doing. So we have the track record of support to show that we are going to do the right thing and implement this in the right way. And the reason we want to assume this authority is actually for all of you. It's really not for us. We're not looking for more work to do at DEP. But really, the way we look at it is we know, we've heard, and Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito have been very clear on their w desire to be partners and to make life easier for all of you, understanding all of the challenges that you face on a daily basis, the budgetary constraints, and just the, the ongoing requirements that you have to live up to. This is an opportunity for us to take the reins and work closely with you to help solve the problems, not, not decrease the, the, the level to which we are trying to preserve our natural ecosystems and our water bodies and our environmental and economic health, but to do it in a different way. And this would allow us to take a holistic approach at the way we manage all of our water. Uh, we're our, we're our, we already wa uh, manage our, our, our drinking water, and we have assumed other authorities from the federal government already, whether it's through hazardous waste, clean air, drinking water standards. We are already the body implementing the federal standards on the state level. We are asking give to get this final authority on wastewater and stormwater to bring it all in and allow us to manage these things on a holistic level to allow us the opportunity uh, with adequate funding that would that would come come with uh, the the delegated authority to be able to get the best available science to monitor the water quality to understand on the local level, the very specific nature of each system that is going to be studied and really have true science and true data specific to the, to the, the, the permitted entity that is moving forward trying to get a permit. And what this allows us to do is to provide technical assistance once we have the infrastructure in place in the office to, uh, to, to use that data, to use that sound science, to work closely with the municipality, to provide you with the technical assistance you need, and have you at the table through one of our four regional offices at DEP to actually craft a permit that is more reflective of the specific needs that the science is telling us, the needs of the community, and the needs for us to implement a permit that is consistent with the federal standards. And we view this, even though it is a tremendous amount of work and it, is, uh, you know, it would, it, it would uh, require about 40 new employees over at the Department of Environmental Protection, even though we, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do already, we think this provides us a unique opportunity to holistically manage all of our water and do it in a way that really helps all of you on a day-to-day -day basis. So, well, thank you. <laughs> And this is something that I, I think most of you know Commissioner Suberg and his staff, and they are 
top notch. They are as good environmental quality experts as you're going to find anywhere in the nation. And they are the ones that really have put this package together. They are the ones that are the, you know, their boots on the grounds that work with all of you and your offices on a, on a day to day basis uh, and, and have tried to intervene already with the EPA in the issuance of of uh, the permits that you either have or the permitting process that you're looking looking at in the very near future or are going through right now and they are they, they are the ones who have really recognized inside of our agency the governor's call for us to reach out any way we can to work with our municipalities to make sure that we are sticking true to our mission of environmental protection but changing the way we do business and offering more solutions to the municipalities and that is exactly precisely what this is all about. I, I, I would be shocked if there is a municipality in this room that isn't touched by a NIPTES permit on, in one way or another, whether it's through wastewater treatment, st municipal stormwater, everybody deals with it. 250 different communities have to deal with this issue, uh, and it is, uh, and a lot of our industrial users. You know, this is becoming a, a, a growing expense for large water users in the Commonwealth that are job providers in all of your communities. So the same thing goes for them. Uh, we've uh, we've done a lot to try to um, you know increase uh, a, a municipal liaison at DEP and a business ombudsman to really try to make doing business with DEP better. And this is the next step, the next major step for us that we hope to put forward. But there is a steep road ahead. This is our second swing at this. We uh, we've tried this in the past legislative session. This was uh, one of Governor Baker's bills last session. We filed it again. Governor Baker is committed to this. He he really wants to see this go forward. But uh, there is um, there's a resistance out there to putting more on DEP's plate. But it's DEP that are the ones that are saying we want to do this because it's the right thing to do. We think we are in a good place. We've, uh, we've seen increases in funding for the Department of Environmental Protection, which was a criticism last go at this. We think we have Department of Environmental Protection in a great place to assume this new authority, but we need your support. We need your help and your advocacy to talk to your legislative delegation, to be that voice for us, to help us and support pushing this through. Because there is a contingent out there who, who thinks that this is an effort to lower the standards of environmental quality that, that the Massachusetts has been so dedicated to for a number of years and will continue. We need to dispel these myths, we need to work together, and we need your support to help us to be able to get a program like this in place to help all of you in your next permit in, uh, you know, what, sometime within the next five years or so. So it is uh, a great hope of ours that um, you could continue. You have been great. The organization has been great uh, in supporting us on this issue. And we look, uh, 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 consider this a, a, a call for help uh, to get out and reach out to your legislative delegation and, and ring some support for this, uh, uh, what we, we view to be a very important piece of um, legislation that is before the legislature right now. Um, so I did want to talk about that and I wanted to talk about a couple of other things because we have, we are, you know, Jay's got all the money and you can tell him I said that when he gets here and I love, uh, I love teasing Jay. Uh, we, we work, so Stephanie Pollock, myself and Jay get together every other week uh, and just the three of us sit down and do a powwow with a lot of the issues because we have a lot of overlap. Um, you know, we, whether it's a, think of any major project in your community, there's some level of economic development or housing, sometimes both, transportation, and certainly a bunch of environmental permitting and energy issues. So we are constantly finding ourselves in a position where we have uh, an overlap between our agencies. So we get together on a regular basis and then we get our teams, probably you know, three or four staff members from each of our secretariats get together and we have a running list and we're constantly tracking where are we on this and our teams are so well coordinated on this and it has made a tremendous difference in the amount that we can move things along and, and you know, some of the behind the scenes stuff that you'll never see or hear about but it is, uh, it is 
it has been a great pleasure and an honor to work with someone like Jay and Stephanie and their staff uh, who have who been able to just get a tremendous amount of stuff because of their collaboration and their, their desire. And, uh, and so it's been fun. Jay is, uh, you know, you, know all, you all know Jay, obviously, from uh, his previous capacity and his, uh, his being all over the planet. And I'm sure he's been to every one of your communities. And uh, he's quite a character and a great guy to work with. And uh, I'm glad he's going to be here. Um, uh, later on to speak with all of you, but we, um, you know, we, we collectively try to get all of the things that we're doing in line with each other. And even our grant programs, you know, Jay has a whole number of grants, you know, Stephanie, of course, uh, implementing Chapter 90 and, um, you know, all of her programs in uh, Complete Streets, whatever it may be. And then we have, I think we have over 90 different grant programs at EEA alone. Uh, we just heard one, the LED Street Program. Um, you know, we have a tremendous amount of environmental programs. We have uh, a whole host of energy programs, green communities, um, gateway communities, uh, different different tree planting programs or where, or, or energy efficiency programs. Uh, you name it. Our list is long, and I think you know. Hopefully, most of you know where to uh, to find that, or someone on your staff does. But we encourage all of you to uh, to reach out and tell us. Tell us what your needs are. Tell us what your proposed projects are. We want to partner with you any way we can. And, and we will never know what's going on and uh, necessarily it's going on in your community unless you bring those ideas forward to us. And, uh, you know, we very much appreciate that. And I ask you to take advantage of some of those programs because they're, they're doing great work. And, and so many of these programs accomplish you know, not just providing an open space benefit or some environmental need, but it also provides, many of our programs provide economic benefits to the, to the, to the uh, cities and towns as well. Uh, whether it's an energy efficiency program, green communities program, things of that nature, uh, there's great uh, uh, opportunity for us to help your budgets with some of these programs in a long-term sustainable way as well. Um, so we, uh, uh, there, there's one in particular, there's an RFP out now that's listed on combines that's coming out of our office, and it is, uh, we're asking for proposals from, uh, to anybody that wants to uh, work with us from a planning perspective and really look at um, uh, a, a, a designs or some various levels of the planning process for uh, um, an overall community-wide approach to uh, uh, start planning your municipality in a way that's consistent with our uh, sustainable uh, design parameters at EEA. Uh, very much a, a sort of a big picture planning process, but something that is certainly in line with um, uh, you know, transit-oriented development and you know, all the buzzwords that we're consistently hearing about. And, and this is in a way that uh, does it in a smart way that preserves open space in your community. And we have uh, this uh, grant that is currently open now listed on combines that uh, will provide both monetary assistance and technical assistance to your community to help you in that planning process. So would like to just point to that as one example of, uh, uh, you know, something that's open right now where we're looking to uh, help you any way we can. Um, one last thing that I wanted to just tell you about was Governor Baker last week celebrated out in Westboro. We had uh, part of our climate week. I uh, was all over the Commonwealth talking about all the things that we're doing relative to climate change. We were celebrating Governor Baker's one year anniversary of the signing of his executive order 569, which was an executive order relative to climate change. We've obviously done an amazing job here in Massachusetts of uh, really leading the nation on the mitigation side of climate change. So reducing our contribution to uh, you know greenhouse gas emissions and you know uh, and the subsequent contribution to uh, climate change, uh, we have enhanced that work that we're doing. Governor Baker simultaneously, right around the, in the same month uh, or a month after. Um, uh, he signed this uh, executive order, it signed uh, the, the major energy legislation, which will be a large procurement of hydro and class one RPS eligible resources and another procurement of, uh, uh, um, of offshore winds, up to 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind, combined together as one of the largest uh, uh, imports 
of clean, renewable energy any state has seen across the nation. It's going to put us on a platform to lead the nation in offshore wind development, which I know is Mayor Mitchell very excited at the prospects there, uh, and a number of uh, other communities excited. There's great economic benefit and uh, is just one more step in us in Massachusetts leading the way on, you know, in this nation, especially at a time where, you know, our country's policies are steering us in a different direction, where we're able to stand up on a pedestal and say, you know, Massachusetts gets it and we're leading the way. And that was all solidified, solidified and expanded upon in that executive order. But what Governor Baker really took an amazing step on that is, um, has sent in the, in the year that we have had to implement since the signing, has already been taken to I think five or six other states and begin to be modeled the exact same way we're doing it in Massachusetts is we're creating a statewide adaptation and vulnerability plan. So think of the physical infrastructure, the key pieces of infrastructure you have in your municipality that as these crazy storms or these droughts hit or the 10 feet of snow hits or the you know more intense tropical storms that are you know being predicted or major floods, think back to Irene and Pioneer Valley and all of these different elements, uh, as the frequency and the intensity of these storms continues to increase, we need to better understand what are our critical pieces of infrastructure, where are they located, what are the vulnerabilities, how can we improve our resiliency, do we have uh, uh, you know, critical pieces of infrastructure in a vulnerable place, what are we doing with our coastlines, all of these, these elements um, of uh, both our natural, physical, and man-made infrastructure that we need to better plan. We need to first start with an understanding of where are all of these assets, how do we categorize them, do we know where they are, take that information, put it into one place, and then overlay for the first time, we now have statewide data for climate change predictive models. And that, that information never existed on the state, statewide scale before. We've worked over the last year with, uh, to, to pull together the best available science. Now we're going to be able to overlay that information on the ID pieces of infrastructure and actually spatially, visual, visually be able to see where those pieces of infrastructure are, where those uh, sensitive areas are, and see what the potential future effects of climate change are going to have on those, on, on those assets. And that's going to allow us to influence future grant decisions, future investments, uh, 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 future public safety needs that we have, um, and, and start making sounder decisions in the future that takes into consideration these vulnerabilities. And uh, Governor Baker's uh, forward-looking approach to this had it not just be an EEA issue. I am co-chairing this initiative with Dan Bennett, the Secretary of Public Safety, because MEMA is already doing a lot of this work. And on the federal level, FEMA is doing a tremendous amount of this work. So we're bringing, we, we are leading the initiative, but every secretariat has appointed a climate change director, and we're going to be doing a statewide inventory of all of our secretariats and all the critical pieces of as, uh, critical assets that are relevant to each of our secretaries. So Mary Lou Sutters will be, you know, obviously looking at hospitals, and uh, Dan Bennett will be looking at emergency response. We're going to get all of these things together, put it into this and have a statewide snapshot of, uh, of, of what our vulnerabilities are and where we need to invest in resiliency. Then, we, uh, that, that's nice that we can do that on the state level, but where it really comes together is on the municipal level. We created the muni Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Plan, and in the first year we put this out for bid, we have 70 communities across the com Commonwealth representing 20% of, uh, of the cities and towns in Massachusetts as being part of this municipal vulnerability plan. We'll be providing in that, uh, uh, we just made that announcement a couple of months ago, and we, are, we have uh, trainers who are going to be, uh, who have already gotten up to speed that each municipality can um, pick their own trainer to work with, where we are collectively with, that, with those groups um, uh, going to work with the municipalities to provide technical assistance uh, and some uh, financial assistance to create that same snapshot of the Commonwealth with the municipal data and the municipal input put into this so we will really get a true understanding uh, both on state assets, municipal assets, and we are going to be working with private entities as well to really try to get an understanding so, uh, of, uh, of, of all of these effects. So. That is, um, in its first year, uh, our, our team has done 
a tremendous amount of work to pull all this together, uh, and it is uh, well on its way. It's actually probably far light years ahead of where I would have expected it to be a year ago. Um, we're going to keep the ball rolling. We really ask that um, you know in the next round of the MVP program that uh, if you're not already a participating a municipality, we ask you to take a look at it and help us out because in the end, what the whole point of this is once we have an understanding, if you have ID'd some very you know sensitive areas or, or things that you are concerned about, that is going to help us influence future decisions, future grant opportunities, future investments we make, not just at EEA but across state government. Government. So it's, uh, it is honestly in your best interest to participate in this effort uh, because it'll help you uh, score better for some you know, different grant programs and things like that. So um, that is just a small little snapshot of uh, all the work uh, our folks are doing in a variety of our agencies. I know uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, just really quickly in case you do have something that's happening in your municipality or a question on anything, if you are not aware at EEA, we have the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of uh, Agriculture, Department of Fish and Game, Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Department of Energy Resources, and the Department of Public Utilities. Um, uh, we also have the MWRA. I, I chair the MWRA, the Energy Facility Siting Board, and the Mass Clean Energy Center. So that's sort of the breadth of what we uh, deal with on a regular basis at EEA, and I'm sure as you, you know, hear that list, you all probably, you know, everyone probably has a DCR issue or a DPU issue with your utility or your Muni light plant. Um, all of that falls under our spectrum. And uh, if I don't have the answer here today, uh, we certainly want to help you if you have any issues or concerns in your, in your community. And uh, we want to be here to help. You know, our door is always open, uh, both literally and figuratively, and uh, we, we really want to be a resource any way we can. And uh, anything that I cannot answer, there's probably high likelihood Stolly can in the back over here. She's uh, 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 our, our office Wonder Woman, who's our, our, our legislative director, but does so much more than that. She writes half of our policies, and, and uh, she's just a, a tremendous asset to our, uh, uh, our team at EEA. And uh, we could help, you know, with any issues you might have.